U.S. Department of Labor, Occupational Safety and Health OSHA. Uh, came on site today, uh, heard a, a roofing nailer from maybe a quarter mile away off down here at the, the red light or the stop sign. I just came down the road to see what was going on. And unfortunately, I came in contact with your crew uh, that weren't protected from a, a pretty severe fall hazard. So upon contact, I made contact with the site foreman. I'm calling you foreman, I know you call yourself a supervisor. Um, Chris, we contacted the owner um, and the, the project manager, and they came out on site, and we're just gonna go through some basic fall protection training in regards to a personal fall arrest system, ladder access, personal protective equipment, hard hat, and eye protection when it's required, and how to implement that stuff at this point. So talking about the, the personal fall arrest system and or fall protection at this point. So anytime in the construction industry, and you guys do roofing and other residential construction stuff. So whenever an employee is exposed to a fall hazard greater than six foot, something has to be in place. So I think you told me you were 5'11", Chris. So anything an inch higher than your noggin, uh, you have to put some type of fall protection in place. So if you guys do residential roofing, uh, we'll talk about the, the safety monitor here in a second. So whenever you're work, uh, working on a residential roof with a pitch greater than 412, you have to have one of three positive means of fall protection. Personal fall arrest system wearing a harness uh, with a lanyard attached to an anchor point uh, that can withstand 5,000 pounds of pressure at that point of shock. You can't fall greater than six feet um, and it has to be implemented properly. So when you're wearing a harness, it has to be the most exterior portion of your gear itself minus your, your tool belt to be on top of it, but everything else has to be underneath it. So if you're wearing a heavy jacket like that, it's gotta be on top of that jacket. Uh, it's gotta be a snug, tight fit. There's gonna be a chest strap that goes across your chest, one that goes across your back pockets. So if you happen to fall, it kind of puts you into a, a cradle to where you can actually sit. Uh, there's a D-ring that, that sits between your shoulder blades in the upper portion of your back. Uh, the, the leg stirrups that have to be a, a tight, snug fit. You can't have greater than two fingers uh, exclusivity underneath it that way it's, it sits in a nice tight snug fit. Now the, the, the different types of lanyards that you'll actually use so there's a, a vertical lifeline there's retractable lanyards uh, there's lanyards that have shock absorbers in it that looks like a little pack inside that that has to be closest to your shoulder blades is where the the, the actual shock absorber gets hooked into and it's the other side gets hooked to the actual d-ring so the actual the the hinge type d-ring it's a one person per anchor point system and there's 16 holes on each side of the actual hinge itself. So depending on how you're fastening it to the, uh, the, the actual truss within itself, if you're going to use two inch or eight penny nails, you have to use all 16 nails on each side. If you're gonna use two and a half inch decking screws, you can shoot them right down the center uh, portion of those uh, the holes because the, the grab strength of two inch decking screws versus the grab strength of uh, eight penny nails is, is very equivalent. Um, prior to putting on the, the actual personal fall arrest system, you have to inspect the harness. So if you pull the harness out of a gang box out of the back of the truck, prior to donning that piece of equipment, you have to inspect it for rips, tears, frays, anything that could uh, compromise the integrity of that system. Within a so that's the personal fall arrest system implementation. So if you're not going to use that system, you can also implement a guardrail system with a 19 to 21 inch bit rail and a 39 to 42 inch top rail. It has to be uh, it has to be able to withstand 200 pounds of force if somebody were to fall against it. And hey, so the implementation of the guardrail system. So it has to be around the eave of the roof. You can't fall over, under, through it, anything like that. It also has to attach or has to be attached to the, to the rake of the roof so you can't fall off the rake as you're working towards this end or that end. Uh, then there's another system out there, it's called a safety net system. Um, once again, they're built on stanchions. They're six to 12 feet out from the edge of the roof. If you fall off the roof, you fall into this safety net. Personally, I've never seen one used on a residential structure. It's usually bridgers, bridging guys, and highway street and bridge guys that use them. Uh, they're pretty expensive, but they are available. Now, in the roofing industry, if you're going to work on a low slope roof, 412 and below, you can implement a thing called a safety monitor, which means one guy or gal uh, that's working on the roof as the safety monitor, and that's the only assignment that that person has. So 412 and below, working on the same level that work is, is uh, happening, watches the edge of the roof, make sure nobody falls off the roof. Now, the safety monitor has to be trained in regards to that person's roles and responsibilities 
has complete control of safety while on the roof doing that that operation and can't be tasked with anything else. Can't talk on the cell phone, can't play pinochle, can't make somebody a sandwich, can't tend the roof, can't measure, can't clean up. The only thing that they do is watch the edge of the roof, make sure nobody falls off, okay? And it has to be designated from everybody else, a high-vis vest or high-vis shirt, something that designates them as the safety monitor for everybody else. Now, if that person has to use the bathroom or leaves the roof, there's one of two things that's gonna happen. Somebody replaces that individual that's been trained and understands the roles and responsibilities of that, or everybody has to come off the roof. Too easy, right? Now, hard hats. So, whenever you're exposed to something falling on your noggin, so you got a guy doing ground cleanup, you got roofers up there doing their thing, the guy on the ground's got to have head protection. Uh, God forbid, you know, a flat of shingles falls off, or hammer, or nailer, something comes down, hits him in the head, or her on the head, something bad's going to happen. Now, if you're on the roof and you're not exposed to anything falling on your head, you're not required to wear a hard hat. Eye Pro, you have to wear eye protection that's been certified by ANSI to make sure that it, it will stand uh, the actual impact of flying debris. Um, most sunglasses are, there's be a little stamp. Uh, anywho, there, there'll be a little stamp on the side that, that proves that they're, they're sound for eye protection. Now, the only time you can need eye protection is when you're grinding, sanding, cutting, chipping, leaf blowing, any time that you can create flying or chipping or sanding debris to where it can hit you in the eye. Uh, if you're up on the roof using pneumatic nailers, absolutely. Sometimes you get that shingle debris that flies up in the air from the percussion itself. You get that stuff in the eye, you really don't care where you're at at that point, you want that stuff out of your eye. And being on that severe of a pitch of a roof, it creates a, a much greater hazard than not wearing eye protection. Too easy, right? Those are the three primary. So, questions? I don't have any personally. Okay. Like I gave you my, my cell phone number. Mm -hmm. uh, please don't hesitate to.